The United States of America and the European Union have pledged $600 billion for infrastructure development in Africa over the next five years. But will this pledge come anywhere close to what the Chinese are already doing in the continent? Let us find out. The first African countries to benefit from the fund include Angola, Zambia, and the Democratic Republic of the Congo. The three countries with the help of the West inked a deal to develop the Lobito Corridor, connecting the Southern Democratic Republic of the Congo and Northwestern Zambia to regional and global trade markets via the Port of Lobito in Angola. There's optimism that the railway will markedly cut travel time, slash logistics expenses, and reduce the carbon footprint associated with exporting metals and agricultural goods. The EU and the US envision a scenario where, once the transportation infrastructure linking all three countries is fully operational, the Lobito Corridor will improve export opportunities for Zambia, Angola, and the DRC. However, it is as clear as day that the two Western powers have something to gain by investing in Africa's infrastructure. It is not for nothing that the corridor is named after the Lobito port, with the export of raw materials being one of the key drivers for the development. The new railway line will definitely give the West easy and quick access to minerals inland. The current Lobito railway extends across Angola for almost 1,300 kilometers and then continues for 400 kilometers into the Democratic Republic of the Congo to Kolwezi, the heart of the Copper Belt. The Lobito Corridor covers the mining areas of the Katanga province of DRC and the Copper Belt of Zambia. The International Energy Agency projects that demand for rare earth metals will grow three to sevenfold by 2040. According to IEA data, total demand for copper and rare earth metals will increase by 40%, nickel and cobalt by 60, 70%, and lithium by almost 90%. In China and in the West, there is exponential demand for EV vehicles. The Congo and Zambia are key resource locations for the minerals essential for constructing EVs and their batteries. Therefore, any nation that would be the first to secure the trust of these African nations will have the exclusive rights to exploit and control the mineral reserves. The allure of Angola, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, DRC, and Zambia is clear to Europeans, with a special focus on the Lobito Railway. These countries boast significant mineral reserves, making them strategic targets for European interests. One could argue that the West is keen on safeguarding access to these minerals, especially as the Chinese strengthen their presence in Africa. It's evident that African leadership finds a welcoming partner in China. Why? Well, the Chinese offer a twofold advantage. Firstly, the Chinese government refrains from meddling in the internal political affairs of African nations. Secondly, China extends a helping hand in the form of much-needed financial assistance, often in the shape of loans. Beyond just monetary support, the Chinese bring with them infrastructure development companies armed with the expertise, machinery, and technology essential for implementing government projects. In contrast, Western nations have been notably tight-fisted when it comes to extending loans to Africa. It's been a while since we've seen substantial American or European funding for major projects on the continent. Instead, what we repeatedly hear is a rhetoric centered on democracy and human rights being imposed on African nations. This unyielding stance from the West has left African nations fatigued with what seems like a patronizing approach. Fortunately, there's a new player in town, one that rivals the influence of America and Europe. China stands in stark contrast to the West, demonstrating fairness in its dealings with Africa. The impact is tangible through the multitude of impressive projects undertaken and successfully completed on the continent. Unlike the West, China's focus on tangible projects has led to visible transformations in Africa. These initiatives not only generate employment opportunities but also contribute significantly to the GDP growth of African nations. A few projects by the Chinese worth mentioning include the Transara Railway, also known as the Tazara Railway, which links Dar es Salaam in Tanzania to Kapirim Poshi in Zambia, constructed with Chinese assistance and officially opened in 1976. This railway notably eased the transportation of Zambia's copper to the Dar es Salaam seaport. Moving on, the Kenyan Standard Gauge Railway, SGR, stands as a modern marvel, connecting the port city of Mombasa to Nairobi and extending to other East African countries. Financed with a $3.6 billion loan from China, this project signifies a substantial leap in regional connectivity. The Addis Ababa Djibouti Railway, built with a substantial Chinese loan of $4 billion, serves as a crucial transportation link. 
Connecting Ethiopia's capital, Addis Ababa, to the port city of Djibouti, it opens up vital access to the sea for landlocked Ethiopia. Mozambique boasts the Maputo Katembe Bridge, the longest suspension bridge in Africa. Constructed with a Chinese loan of approximately $785 million, this bridge connects the capital city of Maputo to the district of Katembe, promising enhanced trade and economic development. In Tanzania, the port city of Bagamoyo has been developed with an estimated loan of $10 billion. This project is a key element in China's plan to establish a special economic zone, anticipating the handling of significant cargo volumes and contributing to regional trade. Finally, in Nigeria, the Abuja Kaduna Railway was realized with a loan amounting to about $500 million. With all these projects, it is evident that China is the real game changer on the continent of Africa, not the West. The West is only out to compete with China. And while at it, America criticizes the Belt and Road Initiative saying that it has no real tangible benefits to the host countries. Though the U.S. may criticize BRI, it is clear that the U.S. cannot go it alone. It will require joint venture efforts of the G7 members. That is why it took all of them to contribute $600 billion. China, on its part, is not phased by the criticism. China government spokesman Zhao Lijian actually rebutted these claims by the U.S. by saying, China continues to welcome all initiatives to promote global infrastructure development. He also added by saying that China believes that there is no question that various related initiatives will replace each other. He said that China is opposed to the pushing forward of geopolitical calculations under the pretext of infrastructure construction or smearing the Belt and Road Initiative. The Western nations are accused of taking advantage of mineral-rich countries, offering unfair prices for the extracted minerals. It also installs its own puppets in power, leaders they can control at will. The mineral-rich countries in Africa are also the most chaotic. The countries are plagued by the menace of terrorists and rebels, year in and year out. The chaos benefits the mining companies as loads of minerals can be uprooted from the continent without any semblance of accountability. What's more, the West will not protect Africa from terrorists. It only protects its interests and companies exploiting resources in Africa. Let us look at Angola, for example. This country has been engraved in the civil war from independence in 1975, lasting up to the year 2002. But to much surprise, American oil companies have thrived undeterred in Angola all through this period. Major international oil exploration and production companies active in Angola include Total, with 41% market share, Chevron with 26% market share, Exxon Mobil with 19% market share, and BP with 13% market share. All these companies are of Western origin. Interestingly, no Angolan company is involved in oil exploration. The United States, when it comes to business practices, falls far from being friendly. In fact, it has a track record of unfair dealings, particularly in the oil sector. Allegations abound that the U.S. has gone to the extreme of seizing control of Syria's oil fields, fortifying its grasp with military might and personnel. The accusation is that the U.S. is essentially looting the oil fields, raising serious questions about its ethical conduct and international respect for sovereignty. This aggressive pursuit of resources paints a picture of a nation willing to exploit its military power to secure economic interests, even at the expense of other nations' autonomy. That being said, the exploitation of mineral and oil wealth in Angola has shamefully left the nation's citizens with little to show. Shockingly, the lion's share of the revenue ended up lining the pockets of the then-president, José Eduardo dos Santos, who maintained an iron grip on Angola for an astonishing 38 years. What's truly troubling is the apparent hypocrisy of the West, a region that claims to champion democracy. It seems the West conveniently turns a blind eye to dictators, as long as they can selfishly extract the natural resources from these nations, disregarding the very principles they claim to uphold. This railway project raises serious concerns about the West's ulterior motives in connecting Zambia and the DRC to Angola. It's evident that the primary goal is to establish a convenient route for the West to transport minerals from the resource-rich DRC to Angola, ultimately destined for the West for further processing. While the Chinese have been relatively fair in their resource dealings, the West seems reluctant to relinquish control of this strategically vital part of the continent. The West is acutely aware that African nations might lean towards favoring Chinese partnerships, prompting a hurried effort to secure and dominate this region through an alleged deal worth $600 million. 
This maneuvering reflects a calculated strategy by the West to maintain influence and control over African resources, potentially to the detriment of fair and equitable dealings. This competitive stance paints a picture of the West, particularly the U.S., driven not by genuine concern for host countries, but by an unabashed fear of losing influence to China on the global stage.